Dead, alive or wounded, the fate of Admiral Viktor Sokolov, the commander of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, remains a mystery a week after his headquarters was hit by a barrage of Storm Shadow missiles. My name is Jerome Starkey. I'm the defense editor of The Sun newspaper, and this is your weekly roundup of the most important news from the war in Ukraine. We will start with the ongoing aftermath of the spectacular attack on Russia's naval headquarters in Crimea in Sebastopol. At least two Storm Shadow missiles hit this imposing monument, monumental building overlooking the Black Sea on the 22nd of September, a week ago. Now. In the immediate aftermath of that attack, there were various claims about who and how many people were killed. Ukraine made it clear they had acted on intelligence that there was a meeting of top Russian commanders in the building at the time. Ukraine's military spy chief, Kirillo Budanov, said the following day that he believed at least nine people had been killed and 16 wounded. He named among those top commanders who were seriously injured the general commanding Russian forces in southern Ukraine, in Zaporizhia, the man in charge of resisting the main thrust of Ukraine's counteroffensive. But since then, the focus has really shifted to the fate of Admiral Sokolov, Admiral Viktor Sokolov, the commander of Russia's Black Sea Fleet. Now, this is a man who was parachuted into the job last year on President Vladimir Putin's orders after the Black Sea flagship, uh, the Moskva, a missile cruiser, was sunk by Ukraine uh, by a volley of Neptune missiles. So Sokolov, a key commander, one of Putin's people, put in to try and reverse the fortunes of Russia's navy in the Black Sea and indeed the reach of Russia's navy uh, across Ukraine because that navy has been responsible for launching uh, a huge number of cruise missiles from the ships, but primarily from the submarines in the Black Sea, can hit targets right across Ukraine. As of today, US officials have said they cannot confirm reports that Sokolov has been killed. Now, those reports first emerged with any authority on the 25th of September, so about three days after the strikes. Uh, Ukrainian SSO special forces claiming a much higher death toll, claiming some 34 people inside the building had been killed and more than 100 had been wounded. It's worth pointing out that Russia at the time reported one sailor had been killed and they later revised that estimate to say uh, that there was no one dead but one sailor was missing. Subsequent to these claims that Sokolov had been killed, uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense, while not commenting them on, on them directly, released footage of a video conference uh, with Ministry of Defense officials at which he appeared to be dialing in uh, remotely. He appeared on a video screen on the wall. He was blinking. Uh, he appeared to be moving, but he was not speaking. That's prompted speculation over whether or not that was genuine footage, whether or not he was really alive. But Ukraine did respond to that by suggesting that it was uh, looking into those reports uh, again and indeed sort of emphasizing that there is still some confusion over who was in and exactly who was killed uh, at the time. Now, the significance of these strikes irrespective of uh, whether or not Sokolov is alive or dead, cannot really be overestimated because the strike on the headquarters was at least the third significant and successful strike on or near Sebastopol in uh, as many weeks. These started on the 13th of September with a barrage of Storm Shadow missiles that hit a Russian landing ship, a Rapucha-class landing ship, the Minsk, that was in dry dock, and immediately next to it, uh, a Kilo-class submarine, the Rostov-on-Don, also in dry dock. Now, these were ships that were not actively participating in the fight in the war at the moment because they were out of the water for repairs, but they were suffered devastating damage as a result of these missile strikes. It appears that they are beyond repair, and even if they can be repaired, it seems impossible that they can be repaired quickly enough uh, to be relevant to the fight as it goes on in Ukraine. Now, after that, uh, we understand Ukraine claims it made another successful strike on what it referred to as a backup communications headquarters for the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. Subsequent to that, they hit 
the Black Sea headquarters, an imposing colonnaded building uh, overlooking the sea, a symbol of Russia's power in Sebastopol. Russia's naval base at Sebastopol has long been uh, a sort of strategic interest, a warm water port for Russia's Black Sea fleet. And indeed, uh, it has been uh, a nerve center from which Russia has coordinated much of its fighting uh, across Ukraine. After the Russians put out that Ministry of Defense footage showing Sokolov at the conference, subsequently uh, other footage emerged where he appeared to be speaking. He appeared to be speaking to reporters. He'd been at a uh, sports event. But actually, an analysis by a Ukrainian journalist, the Kiev Post, has revealed that that footage, or at least that event, uh, took place on the 18th of September. So that predated the attack. And the fact that that footage is being released would suggest that perhaps uh, the Kremlin and Moscow is trying to muddy the waters or perhaps suggest he's alive uh, when he's not. All of which is to say these attacks in Sebastopol, and particularly the attacks uh, on the boats, on the backup headquarters and then on the naval headquarters have had a big impact uh, both in Crimea and in Russia more broadly. We understand from Russian security services, from Russian news outlets, that they have arrested what they say are at least two suspected spies in Crimea. Now that would also appear to be an indication that they are worried that valuable and accurate information about the movement of their personnel is being leaked to the Ukrainian uh, intelligence and military and special forces. In the aftermath of the attack on the Russian naval headquarters, Ukraine's special forces said it was a result of their painstaking efforts. They were able to hit that building at the time and the place of their choosing. Now that's important because the time of their choosing was when that meeting was taking place. So not only had they, according to Ukrainian special forces, managed to glean the intelligence to know when the meeting was taking place. They'd also managed to con convey that information quickly enough and accurately enough so that they could launch the missiles, simultaneously disabling or sidestepping Russia's air defense systems so that those missiles could get through while the meeting was taking place. More broadly, what is the state of the Ukrainian counteroffensive? What is the state of the uh, Russian attacks on the front line? There continues to be an extraordinary amount of fighting. Indeed, one analysis by The Economist newspaper has suggested that the night of the 27th to the 28th of September has seen some of the most intensive bombardments, if not the most intensive bombardments, across the entire front line over the last 18 months. Now, that is based on their analysis of satellites uh, which track fires and trying to disaggregate fires which are caused by explosions from fires which might be caused uh, by other natural causes. Now, that gives us a glimpse that the fight continues even though we might not hear particularly dramatic news about this village or that village being taken by one side or the other both sides continue to invest an awful lot of resources in hammering each other uh, it's interesting when you look at those maps of where the fires are taking place obviously it's along the front line but also you'll see that Crimea particularly is taking a hammering uh, Ukraine is also suffering long-range fires long-range attacks from the Russians deep behind the front lines in central and western uh, Ukraine. In other news, uh, the UK Defence Intelligence Organisation has reported that Wagner fighters appear to be trickling back into Ukraine and indeed uh, the Kremlin has appointed a new head of the organisation, somebody from the Ministry of Defence, to try and take over that organisation which I'm sure you'll remember was led by Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, a former uh, loyal uh, acolyte right-hand man but unofficial sort of eminence grease loyal to uh, Vladimir Putin who ended up falling foul of the establishment leading a botched rebellion and then we understand was on board a plane that was uh, either shot down or blown up as he flew um, across Russia. As ever, thank you very much for your questions. One of them, why are NATO uh, ships not defending the grain exports, Ukrainian merchant ships uh, bringing grain out of Ukraine? Well, part of the problem is that the Black Sea, the Dardanelles Straits, are closed by convention to warships in a time of war. So NATO vessels that are not already there uh, are effectively banned from sailing into the Black Sea. So the Black Sea 
you know, the warships that are in the Black Sea are those that were there when Russia invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February last year. Uh, there are significantly less now than there were on that day, but not least because Russia has suffered at least 10 or 11 uh, destroyed, sunk or destroyed, uh, and Ukraine has also suffered a number of vessels uh, destroyed. But equally, it means that uh, NATO and Ukraine's allies are unable to sail in uh, in order to try and escort convoys in and out. And of course, were they to uh, send their own warships in to escort convoys, that would increase uh, the potential of a direct confrontation between a NATO vessel and a Russian vessel, but that seems unlikely and far off uh, at the moment. A uh, question about the grain. Why is Ukrainian grain that's being driven overland into neighbouring countries and into Europe affecting prices in Europe? S specifically, uh, some of these questions have asked because wasn't the grain deal about getting Ukraine's grain to Africa to feed uh, some of the most hungry people who've relied on uh, Ukrainian grain in the past? That deal has collapsed. Uh, the, day, the grain that is being driven out of Ukraine is not necessarily subject to those same export restrictions. It's just being exported, so it's not necessarily required uh, by any law or by any convention or deal to go to Africa because Russia is not uh, allowing that grain out. Russia is not having any input in where it goes, and therefore it's uh, free to be traded. And the nature of it is, is that you know because. The nature, of, the nature of trade is that you know, the further a commodity has to travel, the more expensive it becomes because of the cost of transport. And therefore, potentially, uh, those grain merchants may see opportunity to sell the Ukrainian grain closer to the border. That's affecting domestic prices because it's effectively flooding the market, uh, the European market, with grain. And that's upsetting, understandably, causing upset to farmers in particularly Hungary, Poland and Slovakia. And they have expressed that back to Ukraine and that's why we've seen fractious relationships between those governments. Uh, and the final question from Jay O'Carlo is can Ukraine play the long game? Can they effectively go on the defensive? Uh, can they try and wait it out uh, and allow Russia to sort of attrit themselves, uh, to wear themselves down, grind themselves down against a wall of Ukraine's building? And it's a good question. Uh, both sides are locked in this kind of war and attrition, wearing each other out. It's like two boxers in a clinch tiring each other out, relying on or, or concerned about who has what in reserve, who can bring uh, extra resources to the fight. It's a gamble. If any side tries to wait the other out and that other side uh, manages to secure a better supply of either men or weapons or money, uh, then of course that gamble may, may not pay off. And Russia, we know, is looking to North Korea to get more weapons. Ukraine, heavily dependent on its Western allies for weapons uh, and money. Ukraine, understandably concerned, uh, and Russia, indeed, hoping that Western resolve may falter the longer that this conflict goes on. And, of course, politics, both in the European capitals and across the Atlantic in America, is likely to have a huge impact uh, on what Ukraine can and cannot achieve. So from that, for that reason, Ukraine is in a rush to try and achieve as much as it can, uh, as quickly as it can, and it has to always balance that rush with the knowledge that attacking too quickly, too fast, overstretching itself, when, if, if its troops aren't necessarily ready or equipped or resourced for the operations, then they may suffer higher casualties. And we've seen that already. So this summer, around May, we saw President Zelensky saying he was delaying the counteroffensive until the, the pieces were all in place. We've subsequently seen him launch that counteroffensive principally in June, and it has made some progress. Uh, but I think everyone is clear that progress hasn't been as fast or as far as Ukraine would have liked. Ukraine has made it clear they're going to continue to fight through the autumn and the winter. Russia has responded by reverting to its winter tactics that we saw last year with this stepping up, increasing its attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure, once again trying to freeze people, trying to crush the spirit, the will of the country to resist by making people cold and hungry through the winter. As ever, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please make them in the comments below this film and we'll do our best to answer them next time.